Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar. My name is Anna Hunsinger, and I'm the Vice President of Community Engagement at Internet2. It's great to have all of you, and I sincerely appreciate that you're joining us today. Happy February, too, as well. Internet2 operates in service of the community, and for us, it is presently important to support our community's needs and what we do to enable their collaboration, community building, and access to Internet2 and other national resources. A primary driver for Internet2 is to enable through collaboration and dialogue what no single institution can do alone, broadening the participation and benefits of what we offer to everyone in the broader US research and education community is important to Internet2, and that is a key motivator for our session today. I'm delighted that we're meeting today to share with you an important step in collaboration and dialogue. Internet2 is honored to be working with colleagues from our membership and with colleagues with the Minority Servants Cyber Infrastructure Consortium and sharing their commitment to enable discovery and scholarship and helping researchers and educators leverage computing and data resources. In support and partnership with this group, last year, Internet2 set in motion an effort to better understand how to expand cyber infrastructure to all in our community through a coordinated effort that puts the needs of minority serving institutions at the forefront of these discussions. Today, you will get to hear a bit more of what we did, where we are, and through my colleagues presenting today, hear where we are in these efforts. For today, our session will feature a number of community speakers that represent this effort and represent voices from historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions and other minority serving institutions. Before I move on, I wanna take a minute to introduce an outstanding lineup of speakers. We plan on having questions at the end, but we will be tracking your questions. So please use the chat window feature and we will get to the questions during the Q and A. Thank you. So our great lineup of speakers. First, Dr. Deborah Dent, Chief Information Officer at Jackson State University. Joel Kutcher Gershenfield, Professor at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. Dr. Damian Clark, Chief Information Officer from Alabama A&M University. Al Kuslikis, sorry, Al, Al Kuslikis, uh, Senior Associate for Strategic Initiatives from the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. Joey Breen, Assistant Vice Chancellor for IT from Claflin University. And my partner in crime with the Q&A section, uh, Bobby Clark, Director of CCIT, IT Procurement and Vendor Management from Clemson University. What a lineup. And uh, with that, let's get started. So thank you everybody for joining us again and let's get this webinar started. Deb. Okay, great. Um, hello, everybody. And on behalf of the members of the Minority Serving Cyber Infrastructure Consortium um, that we will call, uh, we'll abbreviate it from this point on, we'll call it a MSCC. So we won't say these long words from now on. We just like to say uh, welcome. It is an honor and a pleasure uh, to be able to welcome you here today. Um, uh, on behalf of, uh, along with my partners, um, the, uh, my other co-PIs, which consist of Dr. Damian Clark, uh, Joy Brenner, and uh, two more partners that are, are PIs along with us, um, Dr. Richard Olo and Tom Jackson, um, we would just like to say welcome. And we would like to thank, take this time to thank Internet2 for partnering with us and being able to share this information with you. This is just the first of uh, many webinars that we're going to have. Uh, the MSCC uh, emerged uh, some years, a couple of years ago as a result of an NSF funded pilot project um, that was awarded to Clemson University. And we all came together and we met and they helped us individually to start understanding and developing 
uh, our CI plans for our campus. And the first thing that we we discovered is that a lot of us had an idea what cyber infrastructure, we thought we knew what it was, but what we discovered that that meaning is really broad. It's, a, it's really a whole ecosystem that um, was first defined by NSF and it consists of not just the hardware and the infrastructure, the, the, the internal infrastructure, but it's computer systems, data storage systems, advanced instruments, uh, data repositories, visualization environments, and people. And the people part was very important to us. So we've come together. Uh, we started out with three main goals, and that was increasing access to CI resources and enhancing interactions and effectiveness among our researchers and CI professionals and professional and career development. So this survey and, and the information that you're about to be presented with is just the beginning and we're excited. So again, um, welcome. And I'm going to uh, do like uh, Ed McMahon used to do to Johnny Carson. I'm going to say, Here's Joel. So I pass the baton to Joel. Thank you so much, Deborah. What a delight. Uh, and as, as Deborah indicated, uh, we did a what we call a stakeholder mapping survey, uh, initially with the tribal colleges funded by the NSF. And then with additional support from Internet2, we reached out to HBCUs and HSIs we had done a stakeholder survey with the HBCUs two years earlier. So this was in some ways an update on that. The first survey led to the formation of MSCC. Um, and what we find is that when we present these kinds of data, it's not just interesting information, it's actually an opportunity to use data to drive action, to drive results. And so, I will start by giving you some overview of the research and then different people from the consortium will be presenting different parts of the findings. Uh, but let's go to the next slide. Oh, actually, before we do, keep this slide up. Um, I do wanna start uh, with something that um, is particularly appropriate uh, with our tribal colleges, but frankly uh, has implications for all of us. Uh, the stakeholder survey was conducted by an organization that I'm part of called Waymark Analytics. And in doing this, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands across the North American continent. We pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging. And we find it's important to always begin with a land acknowledgement. In this case, the land literally is all of North America. <laughs> so let's go to the next slide. Uh, when MSCC was formed, a vision statement was crafted, uh, and I'm just going to point out some highlights. Notice that the focus is on advancing cyber infrastructure capabilities for HBCUs, HSIs, TCUs, and other MSIs with a focus on data, research, computing, teaching, curriculum development, implementation, collaboration, and capacity building. Um, it's dedicated to lifting up all the, the organizations uh, literally to accomplish together what they can't do separately um, and to speak on behalf of these minority serving institutions uh, who have unique interest and voice um, to contribute to the global research and education community. And many of you may be at institutions that are members of MSCC, um, but I know MSCC would be delighted to bring new people in to the consortium. I see Deborah's nodding her head as I'm talking. <laughs> uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, when we did the survey, um, we uh, were delighted to hear back from a number of HBCUs, HSIs, TCUs, and some other MSIs. And what's interesting is about 40% of the respondents were educators or researchers, but an equal amount were senior administrators, presidents, CIOs, CTOs, and others, as well as some cyber professionals. And you're gonna hear some of the results from some of the different folks. On the right, you see just the diverse set of titles 
uh, that uh, obviously many were more than one in a category that we heard from. But let's go to the next slide, just to give you a better feel of the respondents. We did hear from at least one, and sometimes more than one, from 44 of the 101 HBCUs. And you won't be able to read this whole list now, but the slides will be available. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, which also says that we heard from 63 of the 539 HSIs. And the next slide, 32 of the 38 TCUs. So uh, although there are more institutions out there that we would still like to hear from, uh, we're quite excited to have this breadth of participation in the survey. Let's go to the next slide. And for this, I'm gonna do the handoff uh, to Damien um, who uh, will take us through some of the highlights from the results. All right, thank you, Joel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Damien, CIO, Alabama a and Huntsville, Alabama. So the highlights included uh, similar comments we heard from everyone uh, or most folks um, that responded from the uh, survey. Next slide. So we, we broke the comments down into different sections. So one of the sections was basic needs. So across HBCUs, HSIs, TCUs, there was, there's a deep need for broadband infrastructure support, such as broadband Wi-Fi on campus and at home for students, staff, and faculty. And this has been heightened by the pandemic. Now, just to give some personal experience on this, um, I'm currently the CIO of Alabama a and Previously, I was a CIO of South Carolina State University. And both institutions had an issue with both broadband. When I came to this campus, we had one gig of broadband coming into this campus. I have one gig of broadband coming into my house and I was sharing one gig of broadband coming into Alabama a and uh, to service 7,000 plus individuals. So, so, you know, having been in a meeting this morning with the CIO of Tuskegee, I mean, similar issues again. So um, having, the, having a need for broadband coming into the campus and distributing that broadband across the campuses is, is, is um, something that is, is, is in need. Consistency across institutions. We found that even though there may be unique issues and circumstances that may exist on each campus, there's a plethora of issues that are the same. So if that's the case, then why, why, you know, why try to deal with this, these issues alone? Why, why can't we deal with these issues together? And one of the discussions with the CIO of Tuskegee this morning was like, listen, hey, we are both HBCUs in Alabama. We, we, we can do this better together. Another issue was work workforce development. Students need literacy and advanced skills with data and computing infrastructure. If we don't have the research instruments, if we don't have the devices on campus, how could we teach? How could we train? How could we better ourselves if we don't have these devices? And if we had these de devices, how could I use these devices with one gig coming into a campus that, that has to serve the 7,000 plus individuals? Next slide. Next slide. So another uh, category is collaboration. There's strong support for collaboration across institutions. We all understand that we could accomplish together what we can't do separately. Every time I talk to a vendor, I always let them know that I am part of a consortium. And if you do right by me, then I'm, I'm gonna share that information with the consortium and they're gonna give you a call. If, if, if Tuskegee implemented something and it worked well for them, then I want to know about it. I want to know who that vendor is because I've had vendors where I had to literally kick off campus because they were taking advantage of us because they thought we didn't know what we were doing and they, they thought they had free reign to do whatever they can do. So if we collaborate together, we, 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 we could not make these same mistakes if we, if we just have a dialogue among ourselves. Institutional operations, administrators need a more accessible and responsive data infrastructure. Before we could even talk about data infrastructure and analytics, we need to talk about data storage. If we can't even store enough data um, for our own purposes, how can we have a data infrastructure? So that was another need. Societal impact. There was a strong potential for data and computing to advance research on issues central to community culture and disparities in society. At South Carolina State and at Alabama A&M, we, we are on that proverbial other side of the track. 
So the, 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 the library at South Carolina State and the library at Alabama a and service the community. They, 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 there are no libraries on this side of the town. If somebody on this side of the town needs to go to a library, they have to, they have to drive five, six miles away. It, at, in South Carolina, the library at South Carolina served as a community library for the people and folks of Orangeville, the same, same as Huntsville. So with proper broadband, proper infrastructure, we could service ourselves and the community also. We are anchor institutions for, 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 for our community. Uh, next slide. I think we're going to move on to um, another presenter now. Yeah, I think the handoff is to Al. Al. Oh, sorry about that. I was muted. Uh, thank you, Damien. That was a, a great summary of the highlights. Um, uh, so I'll go through the must haves, the uh, the ways that cyber infrastructure or broadband infrastructure can uh, support the programs that and the, the goals and objectives of our institutions in common. Next, uh, next slide, please. So number one is connectivity and equipment. It, a common need for all our colleges is the actual infrastructure, the, the hardware, the connectivity without which you can't uh, stand up the, the kinds of data computing services and resources that are, that are uh, universally being identified as essential to uh, supporting advanced uh, science and uh, engineering and uh, mathematics. Uh, so the infrastructure also includes uh, data storage, data management and data analytics. The actual use of the infrastructure to, uh, to drive uh, data-driven decision-making to deliver programming in, um, in research computing applied in, in all disciplines. Um, so uh, in addition to the infrastructure, what's needed is the, uh, the research and, uh, and education programming, the capability, the, the faculty who can offer programs and participate in research. Um, one of the number one uh, uh, transformative po possibilities of the infrastructure is impact on society, uh, on the ability to be more agile in, in addressing needs that are uh, emerging, such as COVID, uh, the epidemic, the climate change. Um, next slide, please. And, and actually, as you change the slide, I should add that you know, Al is highlighting the broad themes, but what you see here are also the direct quotes from the comments that people made on the survey. And even though it identifies whether it was HBCU or HSI or TCU, there were many times that we had quotes identical from other institutions as well. But back to you, Al. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Um, so also having the infrastructure, you can deliver training in high performance computing, in data science, data analytics. So without the infrastructure, you can't deliver the training. Um, having the infrastructure also provides the possibility of doing, uh, uh, provides the, the context for doing strategic planning assessment and developing the administrative support needed to, to manage the systems. So you set, you step, it's a kind of a chicken and egg sort of thing. You need to stand up the infrastructure to provide the capability to do strategic planning that's based on the infrastructure. Um, so things like a data management plan, uh, having adequate bu uh, budget allocated to your systems, um, uh, putting in uh, the processes for short-term and long-term IT planning, those are all essential uh, and are predicated on having the, the IT, the cyber infrastructure to support it. Um, as, as, was, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the importance of uh, inter-institutional collaboration. Not very few of our coll uh, collective institutions have the infrastructure in place to implement full data science, uh, science and uh, 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 science education and, and research programs. But collectively, sharing the resources that we have, um, we can bring the, the necessary training and professional development and data analytic resources to all institutions. Um, next slide. 
so barriers to must haves. Um, given that uh, these are some priority areas that we want to achieve, what are some of the barriers to, uh, to actually achieving full, fully implemented cyber infrastructure at our campuses? Uh, next slide. Uh, number one, time, money, and personnel. That, that seems kind of obvious. It's absolutely true. Uh, lacking the financial resources, you can't put in the personnel and or provide the training to your, to say your IT department to operate and manage a high performance uh, computing infrastructure. So funding to acquire the infrastructure and to acquire the, uh, the personnel to operate and maintain. That's a, that's a number one need. Um, providing staff support, the, uh, the, um, the need for administrators at our institutions to recognize the, the value of infrastructure, of cyber infrastructure, and the need to budget for it. So there's a, a, there's a need for funding, and there's a need for prioritizing funding to invest in infrastructure. Um, and then having... Uh, uh, access to the uh, having uh, the capability of working with data, having access to the data. Uh, again, the importance of prioritizing uh, the the need for the infrastructure and the capacity to work with the infrastructure to accomplish uh, goals that require access and use of data. And finally, uh, at least on this slide, limited uh, internet access for our tribal colleges. You know, it's one thing to be able to de deliver uh, 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 broadband uh, resources to your colleges, but to our colleges. But when there's, uh, say, uh, in time of COVID, when there's social distancing rules in place, you have to be able to provide access to the community as well. The the access by students at home to the internet and to broadband resources is really limited. In, in the rural US and particularly in remote places like where many of our tribal colleges are located. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a few others for sure is strategic focus, the need for uh, an appreciation of the, of the opportunities that uh, Broadband uh, data, broadband access to data infrastructure, the the recognition that uh, that kind of access and collaboratively uh, uh, collaborative sharing of resources, it uh, uh, enabled by that access, can be transformative uh, to all of our institutions, to all the communities our institutions serve. Um, one point with uh, tribal colleges access to the data and processes for dealing with working with the data it uh, there's a concern for sure it has always been as long for as for as long as there's been uh, education institutions in tribal lands the 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 pressure to to uh, assimilate to uh, the larger society as important as that is our our communities are also very keen on maintaining language, culture, and, and traditional practices. So the challenge of applying uh, emerging technologies to support traditional practices is there. And that's one that's unique. I don't think it's just unique to tribal colleges. I think all, all uh, somewhat marginalized communities have uh, uh, a, are challenged to adapt new technologies and new methodologies to support, uh, um, to stabilize as opposed to disrupt uh, uh, traditional practices. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, a word cloud, as you'll see, as you can see for must haves, data, access, computing, uh, need for infrastructure, need for secure infrastructure, um, that's th that dominates, and for must have clearly funding, but with funding to support uh, human resources, training, capacity building, all of which are essential to take advantage of the the the, the tra again the transformative possibilities that that uh, broadband, cyber technology, data, computing technologies can provide. 
Uh, so with that, I'll hand it off to uh, the next speaker. I think next up is Joey. Thank you very much. Uh, this section uh, pertains to individuals who identify themselves in the survey as cyber professionals. Next slide, please. We had three basic questions for them. The first of which was, how adequate is the data center capabilities that support your campus and, and researchers? And you can clearly see that 62% of them said it was not adequate for research. So clearly this needs to be improved across these campuses. The second question that came that, that we asked is how was to characterize basically identity and access management on their campus. And again, you see a large number, 82% said it needed improvement. And of that percentage, 41% said it was partly developed, which we find often. And then thirdly, we asked a third question of how would you characterize your cloud computing uh, infrastructure posture when it concerns research and in instruction? Of course, 73% of the uh, respondents said that they had just a, a few or none uh, services and apps in, uh, the currently in the cloud. That's a pretty big number. As a personal story, I'd like to add that uh, concerning the, the first question, Claflin University was an, an award recipient. We're a small HBCU in South Carolina, and we're, we're an award recipient of the National Science Foundation CC STAR uh, grant to aid us in building out our cyber infrastructure. Um, the, and if you're not familiar with that, NSF CC STAR grants provide infrastructure equipment for institutions to support scientific research. We specifically built, in our case, we specifically built out a science DMZ, which acts as a temporary repository for transfer of large data sets, uh, waiting transfer to either our researchers to other or to other alternate research facilities for computational analysis. We see this as a great addition to our research programs and we're seeing wider adoption across the entire institution. And it's supported by our information technology departments. So even though we're small, don't have a ton of people, we're still able to pull this off. On a, it's, it is a smaller scale than a research one, but we're still able to do that. And uh, it's opportunity for other people that may be small, do not count it out. So next slide, uh, I'll turn it over to Deborah Dent at this point. And as we're shifting the slides, I might add that um, there were some other questions that we asked of campus leaders and others of cyber professionals that are in the full report, which is available on request. Um, but um, thank you, Joey, for sharing your CC STAR experience, which I think helps to point to an opportunity that's facing many of the people on this call. But go ahead, Deborah. Okay. And so next, what we're going to do is we're just we're going to talk about some indicator uh, issues that were brought out uh, through the survey. So next slide, please. OK, so the first one is that we looked at some priority applications uh, across the campuses and we um, looked at six areas for data and computing and uh, we looked at it and, and we did everything on a scale from zero to 10, with 10 being very important. And uh, what we can see here is that out of those uh, six priority applications, we see science and engineering topping it off, workforce development, followed by social science and culture, and energy and environment. Uh, all of them, as you can see, health was in there and the language education, they were all in there. But what these indicators are telling us is that we, pro we need to focus in and there should be some action, uh, maybe quicker actions around the science and engineering, the workforce development and the social science and culture. And I give a, a testimony for Jackson State is that one that we're looking at. And in fact, I had a meeting this morning with our VP for research and another research, uh, DOD research lab. And um, there is a big, we're really focusing and we're working, looking at workforce development. Uh, they want to be able to hire our students, but they need to be trained with the right skill set um, for them to go into that. So now what we'll do is we'll just move on to the next slide. Okay. Um, 
some cyber infrastructure issues. We Here we looked at eight infrastructure issues um, that are associated with data and computing. And again, we did it from zero to 10. And in this one, you will see all of them were, were rated pretty high. With cybersecurity, and we know that it, it's at the top, uh, leveraging data and computer to bring in research funding, that is very important to all of us. That is, that is one of the reasons why we even came together um, for our consortium is we're looking at how can we do better about bringing in research funding, leveraging data and com computing to uh, attract and retain faculty, uh, building a stronger movement for minority servicing colleges and universities, uh, cyber infrastructure assessment tools, access to relevant training, access to facilitators, and innovating in the design and operation of cyber infrastructure. All of them were rated in, but they're all interdependent. The next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, all right. Now, there were five uh, issues around sharing resources and expertise. Um, as you can see that, Collaboration. Collaboration is, is a key indicator. Uh, we want collaborations between HBCUs and HSIs, uh, collaboration just among minority serving institutions between HBCUs and TCUs, and just overall. That the, the, and what was great about this is little or no sharing. Everybody wanted to continue to operate in a silo that was rated very low. That's what's great about this. So we're all uh, looking at collaboration. Next slide, please. Okay, and then the uh, last thing is, is that when we looked at the difference between, there was there's a big gap for indicator against what was important, and what was difficult. And uh, the indicators showed uh, that there was a few bright spots that we didn't see a lot of issues with difficulties, but in general, um, there was a more, I don't know, not applicable responses on difficulties as compared to what was important. Um, there were some contrasting views among the, uh, our stakeholders, but what we know that it is, it is important um, that our cyber professionals uh, uh, are able to communicate with uh, our professionals and on all of these difficult issues. And next slide, and I think that I'll turn that over to the over to you, Joel. Thanks, Deborah. And we'll go to the next slide. These were the last couple of comments that we had at the end of the survey. As you can see, some of them were qualitative questions, some of them were quantitative questions. The final things were qualitative. First, we said, what's a phrase or a description that you would use to describe your vision or your work with uh, cyber infrastructure? And we just picked a couple of the comments to list them here. I'll just read the ones that are highlighted in red. Um, we had an Hispanic Serving Institute respondent who said, Forward thinking, seeing computing as it could be, not resigned to how it is. We had an HBCU respondent who said, no university stakeholder left behind. We had a TCU respondent saying, the need to attend to the sovereignty for tribal needs and, and people, as Al mentioned earlier. Uh, there are other comments here and even more in the full report. But what comes through is a clear sense of hope and optimism and a desire for impact. Let's go to the last slide before I hand it back to Damien to wrap up. Um, we also finished, of course, with an open-ended question, anything else? And we had a lot of comments on the anything else. I just highlighted a couple here. Um, one of them pointed out that this is an opportunity to achieve competitive advantage for researchers with respect to the top tier universities, um, that there's ways that researchers and students can make progress here uh, together that you couldn't do separately. Um, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be the case. Uh, there was a note that it's hard for a small institution in a rural area to have the resources to grow and find the qualified staff. And so what's really on the agenda for MSCC and that 
you know, we're delighted that Internet2 is working with MSCC is to take on these challenges working together to really give voice to uh, the communities that you all serve uh, in ways that together you can do what you couldn't do separately. And frankly, that we'll use data and computing to address issues that are important um, to each community. Uh, and the phrase that is often used is uh, nothing about us without us. And that's really the spirit behind this. I'm gonna hand it now back to Damien just for the you know, final next step kind of highlights. Thank you, Joel. So we did this survey, actually this was the second survey that we did as a consortium. The first one I believe was about three years ago. And you know, with the pandemic and everything that's going on, we decided, well, you know, maybe now is the time to do another survey because I think the pandemic forced everyone to slow down and really think and, and understand the need for technology. And the need for technology is not, you know, just buying the latest computer or the latest phone. So we decided to do a follow-up survey and pretty much a lot of what was said in the first survey came back again in the second survey. So pandemic or no pandemic, uh, these were issues that uh, we were all aware of uh, within the consortium and outside of the consortium. But being aware of these things is not enough. We have to start doing something. We have to have what we are calling action impl implications. And we are seeing that there's an immediate pressing need for broadband infrastructure across all minority serving institutions. And by broadband, we are not just talking about broadband going to the, the institution, but broadband within the institution to, to be distributed both via wire and wirelessly across the campus, especially in this time of, of, of um, the pandemic and, and, and social distancing and high flex learning. Second thing is we see an opportunity for workforce development. When we look at high performance, uh, high performance computing professional, more than likely, this is not someone who went to some university and got a degree somewhere in high performance computing. This is somebody who actually worked in that environment for some time and developed those skills after a certain amount of time. But if our community don't have this type of infrastructure, how can we train ourselves? How do we get skilled uh, uh, with, 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 with these specific type of, of CI, cyber infrastructure skills? So the opportunity for workforce development for students, faculty, and staff and my minority serving communities addressing STEM disparities with training and development investment. The third thing is, is an opportunity for social impact because we see ourselves as anchor institutions. It's not just the Alabama A&M in Huntsville or the Tuskegee, you know, it's the entire community around us that, that we, 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 we could um, impact. So the opportunity for social impact through data and computing capacities as we ourselves advance issues of importance. Nothing about us without us, as, as Joel says. Uh, thank you. And I think I'll pass it back to Anna now. Thank you, Damien. And thank you everybody for taking us through um, this set of slides, but most importantly for sharing your perspectives and um, sharing a little bit of your own stories and things. Let's uh, now move to questions and I'm gonna hand it off to Bobby who's been helping with that, but let me encourage all of you that are participating to also use the chat window and the, or the Q&A piece to ask any questions that you would like to. So Bobby. Thank you, Anna. So I'm really honored to be here, a part of the group and the momentum that we're building here to gain a, a, an organization that can speak for minority serving institutions in a way that maybe hasn't been done before. So I'm very excited about that. There were a couple of questions that happened while we were presenting the data that I'd like to get some follow up on from a few of you. One in particular was asking about how the data will be shared. And Joel, if you would speak a little bit to that and maybe some others as well, on what our plans are on about the data and the survey and how it's gonna be shared. I appreciate that question. Um, it, it'll be shared in three ways. One, um, this webinar and others that will be scheduled represent a chance um, for 
folks to attend and engage with the data uh, directly during a webinar. Uh, secondly, we have, when we did the survey, we of course kept people's identities uh, separate from the survey responses to preserve confidentiality, but we will send out the full report to all the people who participated in the survey uh, so that they will have the benefit of that information. Um, but lastly, what I would say is that there's also the chance to um, interact with MSCC and with Internet2. Uh, each organization will have a de-identified version of the data um, so that they can mine this for additional insights and actions. Um, and by engaging with those organizations, you can be part of that process. Thank you, Joel. Would anyone else like to add to that? So uh, I, I, just, I just want to say this is Damien. Um, so, you know, I stated that we did a survey before and, you know, we just completed this survey. As far as I know, I, I don't think a survey like this has been done among MS, MSI institutions. Uh, so, you know, HBCUs, TCUs, HSIs. So, you know, we, we, we welcome the, 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 um, the, the openness of the data for use in, I think Joey and, and, and Deborah spoke about different types of grants, to use in those grants so that you, you can state your case beyond, let's say, an emotional plea. Now you have empirical evidence that says, you know, a survey was done, these are the needs that we have across the community. And we need the funding, you know, as, as <laughs> you have a famous, famous saying in Trinidad, we need the money. Right. And, 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 you know, you have empirical evidence to back that up. So reach out to us and we'll, we'll be happy to share the data. We're working on a website. In fact, it's on me. It's my fault. So I'm working on a website and we'll put, put it out there so that you can reference it from, from out there. Thank you. Uh, this is Al. I'd, I'd just like, like a, make a little bit of an addition to that comment. And that is that this data is very dynamic that as we imp implement these uh, strategies to get CI awareness and uh, programming implemented at our respective colleges or institutions and facilitate partnerships across our institutions, the, the priorities are gonna change, the, 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 the strategies for, for implementing uh, data computing infrastructure at our institutions and collaboratively is going to evolve. And I think it's gonna evolve very rapidly so uh, it's a moving target and uh, act, acting on the data from the survey now is important, but certainly keeping our fingers on the pulse of, of our institutions and the work that we're gonna be doing collaboratively. It's an exciting time. It's something that we wanna definitely watch very closely. I'd like to actually piggyback on what uh, was just said. Uh, first of all, I wanna lift up something that AHAC did, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, which is they took just the TCU data and did a briefing of TCU presidents. Um, and we can do a breakout of HBCUs or HSIs as well. So there's an opportunity to organize briefings for targeted communities as something that I would lift up as an opportunity. Um, but I also wanna point out that there's been some discussion in MSCC, instead of waiting every two or three years to do a big survey, Hold on a second. And I believe he's going to mention that uh, that we wanted to do a more targeted approach for questions that are done in shorter time frames. Is that right, Joel? Exactly, Bobby. That we've talked about, and I don't know whether the cadence will be twice a year or three times a year, but to ask a few targeted questions on a continuing basis so that you can have a steady flow of data for the kinds of proposals that Damien was talking about or for your own strategic planning. So um, I really wanna lift up the way in which this initiative is really using data to drive action. Thanks, Joel, because that's a very important point to be made. The idea behind the survey for us is to provide that kind of access to data that will improve proposals that you make to the funding institutions and honestly, we have others from the institutions on this call, I'm sure, who are looking at what the needs are. And now we have empirical evidence to really focus on those items. 
I do mention, we've mentioned the MSCC a bunch of times, and I thought I would also ask the, the members of the MCC on this call to talk a little bit about how we started. Um, we know we, we had a workshop about three years ago, but talk about what, it, what, what that particular, was, uh, particular growth was from your institution. And I'm looking at that CIOs are on the call who maybe can speak to that very quickly. Okay, one thing that um, when we started, uh, we started as a result of the, uh, the NSF grant that uh, Clemson had, and they were really instrumental in helping us. And, and we all worked together. And the first thing was developing our CI plan. Uh, and we have all been having a hard time getting that first uh, NSF grant for like cyber infrastructure grant. And because we were all able to come together and we were able to even share information, they shared with us examples and we've shared it amongst each other. We were able to, each one of us, I believe that the one that we're on here, we all got that, that first CC Star grant. And then we were able to, to continue to meet and to share and to exchange ideas and together collectively, um, we're able to now go work together to go after uh, additional grants. So I know that Joey and Damien uh, have more that they wanna add to that. Yeah, yes, Deborah, if I may go before Joey. Um, so <clears throat> I, I wanna focus on something Deborah says that, that surprisingly it's a problem. And I, I think this is causing an obstacle for a lot of people to move forward and, and that's sharing in a trusting environment. Now, th this thing started with a conversation. They were saying NSF grant, all of that is correct. We, we, did, we, we, we had an NSF grant together. We wrote NSF grant separately. Jackson State, Claflin, South Carolina State, Alabama a and now received um, their own NSF grant. But, all of that began because as a bunch of CIOs, we came together, we put aside our fears and we had a conversation. The conversation I had with, it, with, this, with, it, with the uh, Tuskegee CIO this morning, this is the first time we actually sat down and you know, got the time to speak. We were laughing and, and having a whale of a time. What do you think we were laughing about? I couldn't join the meeting on time because my system was down. <laughs> All the mess that she was going through and, and don't know how to get through the mess. And I'm giving her my experience and, and my advice. And she's giving, her, giving me her experience and her advice. So we are, saving, we are saving each other time and effort and heartache by that one conversation. And I think, you know, and I'm speaking from the CIO's perspective, and I hope there are presidents on the call. If, you don't allow your CIO to speak up and you don't allow yourself to listen to your CIO and at least try to help out your CIO, then we'll be stuck in this mess. And this consortium actually was a, a safe place where first CIOs and faculty came together and we were just trashing it out. And then suddenly we said, hey, we need to do something. And that's where the grants came in. And, and you know, and Clemson, I have to... to, to to give a big shout out to Clemson. When I got the call from Clemson, I was like, who, who are these people? Who, who, why are they bothering me? I, I have so many things I need to do. But you know, they, they were like, listen, listen to what we have to say. It's not just talk, we have a plan. And we executed the plan and it wasn't easy. I kid you not, it was not easy. It took a lot of extra time on top of everything else we had to do, but it was necessary. And because of that, this is where we are today. So let me speak, I'm going to shorten this down to a, probably about try to do it in a, in a minute. Um, so hang with me here. But the problem, when I first came to Claflin University, we had a whole bunch, you know, there was a lot of problems and we got a lot of things resolved. Um, it, like, like Damien said, things were not working quite right and so forth. Uh, and we got that, a lot of that stuff resolved early on. But then I, I found a student for me, the driving piece for, for me in Claflin University and trying to push forward, which I knew nothing about internet too or any research or anything like that because I always came from small institutions and I'm still at a small institution. And we found a, a student who, who tried to give, um, uh, who, who got accepted to a very large school 
And I saw him in a hallway and said, hey, glad you got accepted. And he looked, he had just found this information out and I called him like a few minutes after he found out and he looked down and I just said to him, why aren't you excited about this? an exciting piece. And he said, it's not my number one school. And when I asked him, you know, I said, well, did they tell you why you didn't? And he said, because I didn't have HPC experience. That's why they wouldn't let it. And he, what he did is he chose, that struck me. It still strikes me today. And that's the driving force. And I felt like Claflin University, though we had done good things for him and he was able to get there like he's supposed to, um, we failed him in, in trying to get to his ideal school. And so uh, it just stuck with me. And I, we sought out Clemson, like everybody said, like we've been on, on Clemson's backbone for, I don't know, 10, 11 years now, something like that. Uh, I've forgotten how long now. Um, that's how long I've been here. And that was the driving force for us. So that started the whole thing out for us, getting with Clemson. And then they come up with, you know, Damien and Damien and I got together. I think we were the first ones because uh, he didn't know anybody else except me. And we started talking and then Clemson wanted more. And so they got more people involved and that's how we all got started. So the rest of the story is after they took up. So that was Claflin's story and, and my story of how we got started. And I didn't know anything about it, nothing. So we started from scratch. And uh, as small institutions, you'll have that struggle. And I, I can certainly help you there if you're looking for something, somebody to talk to about it. And they can understand I'm certainly open to any conversations. So that's it. I went a little longer than a minute. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, Bobby, so, if I may add to what Joey said, you know, Joey has been a CIO much longer than I have. So, you know, I, I looked up to him and I, Joey's right, there's somebody you can call anytime and, and you know, he'll be happy to talk to you. But what hurt me the most, and, and Joey just said it, I didn't know anybody else. Exactly. <laughs> I, I didn't know. I, I knew there were 100, 100 plus HBCUs out there. I didn't know any of the other CIOs. There was no organization, no structure to reach out to, to, to anybody to, 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 to get help. And that blew my mind, actually. And I, I just like to you know, go back to something that Deborah said as part of her introduction, which is it's not just the equipment, it's also the people. And what you're hearing are the stories, the lived experiences of all of our speakers. And what's behind it is the notion that so much of what people have had to do has been on their own. And what's behind this is the connections that will help you as the human infrastructure to the cyber infrastructure. That's and, very and, key. It, and go that ahead. was, go ahead, John. And that go, was a motivation ahead. for the consortium. I just wanna say that is what really pushed the consortium to move forward, to, 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 to create this space where people could come together. It is definitely about building the community and answering many of the questions we had there. I wanna talk a little bit because there was a question asked about cybersecurity and how that might work, but I don't want you to just speak to that. Talk about how, what, are, what the plans are for, for MSCC and this data and how we might solve some of the bigger ticket um, subjects that came up and cybersecurity was certainly the number one thing that showed up in one of the survey sheets. So without getting into the weeds of technology and stuff like that, sometimes we talk about cybersecurity, broadband, like if it's a rare mineral a mile deep on the moon, a lot of this stuff is not that difficult to do if you have the right resources. However, from a small school perspective, getting the right resources is not as easy. So something I, I said earlier on, which I always do when I talk to a vendor, I say I'm part of a consortium and I put it on the vendor's lap to, uh, to, to, to deal with me, not as Alabama a and but deal with me as a consortium. And they always come out and say, well, you know, if you, you, in your consortium, we, we could do this better as a group. So whether it's cybersecurity, broadband or whatever, one, we could procure better as a group and get these services at a, at a lower price. The, the, the technology is there. I, I always look at it, I, I always tell vendors, I don't wanna hear about the gadget no more. I wanna hear about the SLA, the service level agreement. Tell me the service you're doing, put that down on paper, sign, sign, and then we can move forward, right? So doing that as a single entity is not as easy as doing that from the perspective of a group, an entity of 
you know, more than 100 institutions. The technology is there to do it. We just need to have the organization have the will to do it, whether it's broadband, cyber infrastructure, or whatever. And, you know, as you, you talked about the, the broadband, um, what came out in the, the whole pandemic was uh, broadband. There, there, there's a, we had an issue with it. You know, uh, when you talk to most small schools, HBCUs, uh, TCUs, everybody, there was, there was a problem with it. And the problem was to the point that it wasn't even just about, did you have the right infrastructure on your campus? Did you have the capability of reaching your students because the students couldn't come back to school? You know, it, it let us know then that we have a broadband problem even with the last mile. So with us all coming together, uh, we've been a, we can talk now and and we're stronger as a as a unit as a consortium to address even more than them solving the problems just for Jackson State, but solving the problem for the state of Mississippi, or solving the problem for Alabama. So I think this is the beginning, and that as we work together, uh, we won't get overlooked. And that's the key is that we won't get overlooked in and that this won't be just something temporary, but this will be a permanent fix uh, so that we can continue to address that digital divide that's still there. Yeah, but that's, that's a very good point. And I think one of the questions that's coming from uh, Dale Smith talks about human connection and building that on top of the, the the physical things that you build a network on, but it takes a human capital to make those things work and, and to get the value out of it. Uh, thank you for that question, Dale. So um, any last thoughts of where the data uh, will lead us as far as um, what projects are out there? I know that there are several funding opportunities and maybe there are some people on the call who can speak very quickly to what those funding opportunities are. And if there are anything else that we wanna bring forward as far as a question, uh, for how this data can be used. So I, I think Joey mentioned, um, and Deborah, the CC star. <laughs> for a CIO, I, I think that's the, the, the go-to, um, the go-to NSF funding opportunity. Um, the CC star, normally NSF funds um, research-oriented projects, but the CC star NSF grant funds the cyber infrastructure to support the research. So if, you know, you know, I had faculty who would, you know, create some data, put it on a hard drive and mail it to the collaborators in another school because we just didn't have the bandwidth to, to, to transmit that data. So this is where the CC star funding comes in, where you can update your cyber infrastructure for research purposes. And now your, your researchers could transfer data, collaborate better among themselves. Uh, there are other entities out there, USDA, uh, there's the FCC, um, the FCC programs where if you get involved, they are specific for um, broadband. They, they are money specific for broadband activities. Okay, so um, let me wrap us up. Uh, thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Damien. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Dev. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Joey. But uh, thank, thanks to also all of you that um, if you're not participating today live, but that you will get to see the recording. And thank you for everybody too that uh, has helped this effort through responding to the survey. As it was mentioned, and today you just got a preview. And we're planning in coordination with the consortium to organize more webinars and outreach activities to then uh, go a little deeper in some of the areas. There's so much data um, and that's and data is powerful and data can be a challenge too as we think about what next too, but it's there. And we're so appreciative and grateful at internet too that we have the opportunity to engage and participate in this dialogue with you as well. So, uh, but as you see, this is not a shy group. So uh, please, uh, 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 a round of applause to our speakers. And uh, we, you know, this was a great public dress rehearsal for many other opportunities to come and talk and engage with the group. 
please, uh, any questions that you may have, feel free to send them to either Internet2 or to any of the participants today. And with that said, we're going to wrap it up. And thank you, everybody, for participating today.